Hi everyone, in this video from Count Backwards from 10, we're going to take a look at the blood pressure cuff, how both the automated and the manual ones work, the common issues you'll encounter with them, and common questions that you'll see come up in your exams. So first, to understand the automated cuff, it's in our best interest to understand a traditional cuff first. So, once the blood pressure cuff is wrapped around the arm, which we'll delineate here in a blue dotted line, the practitioner places their stethoscope here over the artery. In this situation, we're talking about the arm and the brachial artery. Then they inflate the bladder of the cuff. So, once it's inflated to a pressure greater than that of the systolic blood pressure, greater than systolic blood pressure, all blood flow through the brachial artery is then occluded here. Then the user allows the pressure in the cuff to fall and listens for what are called the Karatkov sounds or sounds of blood moving through the vessel. So we're going to go ahead and erase this little section here. So we had an occlusion and now it's going to look something like this. Now you should know there are five phases of these sounds and I encourage you to look them up, but functionally for this video, they're not really clinically relevant. Now hopefully we all know that as blood begins to move through the vessel again, as the cuff pressure decreases, the first sound you're going to hear is going to be representative of the systolic blood pressure. As this is the time when the hydrostatic pressure within the vessel is greater than the cuff pressure during systole, allowing blood to flow through it again. but turbulently, which is the reason we get a sound. Turbulent blood flow creates sounds. Now, this is the same reason that when you listen to a fistula or a stenotic carotid, you hear a brewy. It's because the vessel does not allow for laminal blood flow, and therefore you get the sound of turbulent blood. Now, you're going to continue to listen as the pressure in the cuff decreases and the blood vessel is able to open more and more because the pressure inside is higher relative to the cuff as it begins to deflate until you no longer hear a sound. Once there is no sound, this is representative of our diastolic blood pressure. And it means that our vessel here is now completely open again. And the reason you lose the sound is that now during diastole, the pressure inside the vessel is great enough that the vessel is completely stented open and there is no more turbulent blood flow to be had. Again, the blood pressure cuff occludes the artery, which causes turbulent blood flow. And the first sound you hear is the systolic blood pressure because that's when every pump opens the vessel enough to create turbulent blood flow, and then when there's no sound again, that means that the vessel is open enough during diastole that there is no more turbulent blood flow. It's completely open. Now, it's important to note that when doing a manual blood pressure, we are directly looking at the systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure, which we then use to calculate our MAP, which you will all see the equation systolic blood pressure plus two diastolic blood pressure over three. So now let's take a quick look at the automated cuffs that we use in the operating room, and they work a bit differently, although conceptually they are the same. So let's go ahead and erase all this real quick. I should probably make this bigger. Great. So our automated cuffs, on the other hand, like we said, conceptually the same, they're gonna occlude the arterial blood flow in a given region. But machines can't auscultate, but rather they sense vibrations. This is referred to as oscillometric, excuse my spelling, monitoring, and people have been asked about this on their oral boards. So, like we said, while the cuff is inflated and blood begins to flow again, while it's turbulent, it starts to create a sound. And hopefully we remember from basic physics that sounds are the results of vibrations and that vibrations are what the machine in this case is looking at. There are vibrations through the air that's inflated the cuff and they're transmitted from a physical signal to an electrical signal and they actually measure the map 
directly, not the systolic and diastolic pressure, but they measure the MAP directly. And that's at the point of maximal vibrations. Again, point of maximal vibrations, same thing as the mean arterial pressure. The computer then, using an algorithm, goes back and calculates the systolic and diastolic pressures. So, like I said, conceptually, the two work the exact same way, automated and manual, but their end measurement is different. So the big thing that's going to come up is cuff sizing. And what happens when a cuff is too big or too small and why? So for starters, a good ballpark for cuff sizing is that it should cover about two thirds of the patient's arm. So let's look at cuff too big. So if you remember nothing else, cuff too big, pressure too small, and conversely, cuff too small, pressure too big or too high. So the reason, when the blood pressure cuff is too big, and we'll draw a cross section of an arm here and we'll put our blood pressure cuff here in this burgundy color, there's a lot of overlap of the cuff onto itself. And what happens is in this section where the cuff is beginning to inflate, the cuff is actually going to go ahead and compress on top of itself, which will cause a premature occlusion of the artery that's running through the middle of the arm. This translates to a lower blood pressure reading. Now there's also some thought that because the cuff is too big, it also makes it so that the oscillations and the vibrations that move through the air of it do not reliably get to the computer the same way, and that's also more than likely very true. So between the distorted waves of vibrations along with a blood pressure cuff that's inflating on top of itself and prematurely occluding the vessel, your blood pressure will read in lower when your cuff is too big. Now conversely, if we have the same arm and the same little blood vessel in the middle and your blood pressure cuff doesn't quite reach the other side, it takes a significantly more amount of volume to increase in pressure to get the same closing of the artery because the cuff doesn't properly circumnavigate the arm. This leads to higher volumes, higher pressures to occlude the artery, and this leads to falsely high blood pressure readings as a result. Now the other thing here is leaning on the cuff, and this is something that the surgeons will do, even though they say they aren't, ha uh ha. -huh. And what you're going to see is some blood pressure like 176 over 155, and you're sitting there saying, oh my God, what happened, and you panic, desperate to get the blood pressure down, only to soon after realize that the surgeon was leaning on the cuff, like we said. So again, as mentioned before, the pressure is equal to force over area. And when I say mentioned before, I mean in other videos. Because you have falsely, or in this case, not actually falsely, but actually decreased the area of the cuff, it will cause the pressures to be falsely elevated as the computer calculates the diastolic pressures because someone's leaning on it. And sometimes this is extraordinarily over-exaggerated for the blood pressure. So anytime you see these enormous pressures and they don't seem to correlate with what the patient was demonstrating earlier, there's a good chance the surgeon is leaning on the cuff and doesn't know it. Just ask them to lean off for a second, repeat your blood pressure, and you should be good. So that's all for the basics of the blood pressure cuff. We're going to take a look in another video at arterial line blood pressure readings and hopefully compare them to our cuff. If you have any questions or topics you uncovered, please write to us. Otherwise, check in for the next video.